Well, good morning, everyone. Lovely to uh, be gathered again for worship this morning. There are just some notices which we need to uh, to kind of give uh, before we start um, our worship. Um, one or two are a bit complicated, so I hope you'll be able to take it all in, but hopefully they will be a little bit self-explanatory. Firstly, uh, as we have been doing the last few weeks, there will be uh, the opportunity to meet others over coffee, bring your own, um, following this service via a, a Zoom link, which Dan will be sending out. Um, if he's not already sent it out to you, uh, it will be coming out very shortly. Secondly, to say that this evening we have a Thinking Aloud service where we're looking at the birth stories in the Gospels as parabolic overtures. Sounds complicated, but less complicated than you might think. Uh, and you're all welcome to join that. Uh, and Dan again will be sending out the link for that service. And that's at 6.30 tonight. Next Saturday, we are going to be delivering a bag of items to all who connect with the services. That is, unless you live in, um, in foreign climes like Derbyshire uh, or, or wherever. Uh, apart from, we're hoping that we're going to send those items um, to people uh, who aren't local. So uh, we just want to make sure we've got all the information we need. So firstly, uh, those of you who join by phone, and we have a number who join by phone, and therefore we do not have their details beyond their phone number. If you could contact Deborah Cornish, either by phone or email, uh, to let her know who you are and your address, then we can make sure we have your details so we can add them to our list of deliveries. We're going to be delivering things for communion service and for the carol service. Uh, and so we just want to make sure we have that. If you could get in touch with Deborah by Wednesday, that would be really helpful. And then for those of you who are thinking of coming, of at attending the uh, communion service on Christmas Eve at 11.30 p.m., uh, we also need to know who you might be so that we can make sure we deliver uh, the items for the communion, for the extended communion for that night. If you could let me know, either by email, or you could actually use the chat box this morning um, and say, yes, I'm going to be at midnight um, or, or the Christmas Eve communion, then we can make sure we have a list and we can deliver enough of the elements around to those who are attending that Christmas Eve service. And if you could let me know that by Friday, then we can make sure that's all packed in the bags because we need to deliver that next Saturday as well. Finally, before we start our worship, just to say that we want everyone to have the opportunity to contribute to our carol service next week. And the way we're going to do this is by giving everybody the opportunity to be singing or have their voice recorded, which will then be uh, played on the Sunday evening carol service. Let me say and stress, that doesn't mean you'll be singing as a soloist. What it means is that you'll be given the opportunity to have yourself recorded. Uh, and once recorded, that will be uh, immediately sort of sent back to uh, the person who is going to put all the voices together, like some of the virtual choir bits that we've had in our services over the last few months. Uh, whether or not you'll have your picture, I'm not quite sure. You might. But we're very, very grateful to Simeon Brooks for all his help in this. So what will happen is that uh, I think on Tuesday you will receive an email and in that email, there will be a link to um, the carols which you can record yourself singing. The way that you'll do it, there will be instructions given in the email so that everyone will be, you'll be able to have the kind of full instructions. But basically, you'll click on the hymn, uh, you'll record it, it will, it will kind of record as you sing along. 
The words will be there for you to sing. So, uh, so that would be uh, easy enough to do. You don't need your hymn book or anything. The words will be on the screen as you sing to the accompaniment that is being recorded by the Brooks family. And then when you are happy with your recording, you will just then submit it and it will go immediately to, to Simeon so that he can put them all together. Uh, and he'd like all of those by Tuesday, by Thursday evening. So you'll have about a day and a half in which you can record yourself. So the instructions will be fully there, but you'll be able to sing things like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, or Come All Ye Faithful, or Little Town of Bethlehem, and things like that. Some of the uh, carols that will then be used for our carol service, and then over the next few days during our Christmas services. So we hope that many of you will take that opportunity to record yourselves uh, and then they'll all be put together, the voices. So we will form either a heavenly choir or something else. And we wait to see what that something else might be. We turn then now to our service this morning uh, and we're going to have contributions from uh, Jonathan Greystock a bit later on and also from Marianne Key, uh, Dan's sister. And so we're really looking forward to that um, in all that we do. But we begin our worship by singing 175 from our book, Light of the World, You Step Down Into Darkness. So let's pray. God of mystery, God close, God in all things, in all places, in all time, we worship you. As we worship, may we know that although you are far beyond our imagining, you are closer than our very breath, for you are life itself. And as we worship together, May our hearts, our minds, our souls be open to your presence, to be aware of your presence, to know you and be strengthened in our daily living. We thank you that in Jesus, we have seen the fullness of Christ. And therefore seen you, your image imprinted on earth. As we speak of him, of his birth and of his life, we pray that in knowing him we may know you more clearly and so love you more dearly day by day. For this we ask in his name. Amen. Christmas, as we know, is a time when many people, many families, many different countries have different traditions uh, and ways in which they prepare themselves or get ready for Christmas celebrations. And so we're just going to watch a short scene from Olaf's Frozen Adventure, which is uh, just a clip which speaks or sings of some 
traditions set in Olaf's frozen world. Well, I don't know what traditions that you have in your house or how it is that you get ready, but one of the ways that obviously we've uh, been used to in the past getting ready in our churches is, uh, and maybe in our houses too, a displaying of nativity scenes. Now at Hove, we've kind of usually had our nativity scene inside the building, in the, in the sanctuary. But this year, we're not going to be having people in our sanctuary. And so we've had to think of a different way in which we can get ready to show to the community around Hove how we are seeing this season still as a season for hope and for joy and for peace. And so here's just a short video of, um, of Mark Gregory getting us or helping to get us ready for Christmas at Hove. quite amazing what you can do in 15 seconds really well maybe it took a little bit longer than that um and here is what it now looks like in the front entrance of hove methodist church so uh dan's just going to put a picture up i hope for us of what it looks like at night while he's um just getting that ready um just to say that some activity sheets that have been sent round have uh, one or two sort of uh, opportunities to make your own um, stand up uh, scene, nativity scene, to cut out and colour in uh, and do so that that works that way. And that's what it looks like at Hove in the evening. And you'll see, not only is there a nativity scene uh, in there, but you'll see the love, which is emblazoned on the windows, which are facing one way, and we've got the word hope on the windows on the other side. And we also have a Christmas tree outside. And this is where we'd like to invite you to support in different ways. And so, what uh, one of the sheets that has been sent out, um, although you can make your own, is uh, has Christmas baubles on it, Christmas decorations. And what we kind of uh, would invite you to do is to decorate a Christmas bauble and maybe put on a message of hope uh, or love and peace on it and email it to me or send it to me or perhaps even better, walk past the church one evening, see what it looks like, lit up like that and um, put the bauble on the tree so that we have messages of hope and love for our community and for ourselves. And so we invite you to do that as you get ready for Christmas yourself. Not only would those messages of hope and love be uh, as baubles on a Christmas tree, but they're also the way that we should live our lives. We should be messages of hope and love to all who we meet. One of the other traditions that we have in most churches is that of an Advent ring. And so we turn now to Dan, who will lead us in our Advent liturgy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. You won't be able to see me as my camera's pointed at the Advent ring. Um, I'm just going to, in the chat box, uh, put down our liturgy, which I'll uh, lead us in. So you're... Um, you're welcome to follow along um, as we go uh, and we'll sing the third verse of uh, of our song which is uh, longing for food this week in the chorus which um, which follows and then we'll turn to our advent ring we wait for the coming of christ giving life in abundance come giver of life and we sing together their verse and so i uh, light now the third of our candles
the bread of life given for all people, a sharing in the body of Christ. Come, giver of life. The desert shall rejoice and blossom abundantly. Rejoice and be glad in it. Christ, shine in our world today. Thank you, Dan. And so I invite you to uh, cut out those nativity scenes, cut out the baubles, decorate and do, and we'll see maybe what people have done uh, towards the end of the service. We turn now to our first reading, which is from Isaiah 61. And following this reading, we'll have a reflection from Jonathan. Thank you, Dan and Andy, and hello, everybody. My reflection is on waiting well. For Advent is a time for waiting. How good are you at that? Do you find waiting hard or easy, frustrating and to be avoided, or helpful and to be welcomed? Do you log on early for these services and then occupy yourself reading notices, attendance lists and chat box? Or do you quietly prepare yourself for worship? If you log on late, maybe it's in order to use every minute of your time, like I do. But does it then make you anxious about being admitted in time? Maybe you're a driver. How do you react to heavy traffic? Do you sit back and listen to the radio and think about your destination? Or do you search your map and sat nav to find another route to keep moving? If you're a passenger, do you quietly watch the world go by? Or keep asking, are we nearly there yet? Many of us will remember either having been or had passengers like that who found waiting difficult. And helped us look at our advent ring and that originated partly from a pastor in 19th century Hamburg in the 19th century called Johann Wischern who wanted to help his children in waiting for Christmas so he made an advent calendar by attaching 24 candles to a cartwheel with 20 red ones for weekdays and four white ones for Sundays and then as they lit each one every day from December the 1st to the 24th, they thought of each day as the day nearer the coming of Christ. Well, Johann's idea was later adopted by the church, who just reduced it to four red candles to mark the Sundays leading up to Christmas, and followed by a central white candle on Christmas Day. And every part of the Advent ring came to mean something, so the ring signified infinity because the circle has no end. Its evergreen leaves signified eternity because evergreen foliage survives the winter. And the candle flames signified Christ's light, while the four weeks of Advent celebrated, and here you have a choice, either hope, peace, joy and love, or all of us, the prophets, John the Baptist and Mary. You may want to combine the two, and then you get hope in everyone, peace in prophets, joy in John the Baptist, and love in Mary. Well, this is the third week of Advent, and I'm going to leave Mary Ann to reflect perhaps on John the Baptist. But now we'll just look at the prophet, one of the prophets, Isaiah. Isaiah's 61st chapter was brought to life for us today by the Salvation Army of South Australia. In that video. In the New International Bible, the chapter is entitled The Year of the Lord's Favour, which seems a rather inappropriate choice this year with its barrage of bad news about the COVID 19 virus and all the damage it's done to the world's health and economy. This combined effect has caused physical and mental suffering on a scale like a world war. But just as war brings out the best in us, along with the worst, this pandemic has done too. 
Take a global example, the vaccination programme, which began to be rolled out in the UK this week. That was the culmination of unprecedented cooperation between a Turkish scientists, two pharmaceutical companies, one American, one German, producing a vaccine in Belgium and distributing it through France. That sort of worldwide cooperation was something we prayed for earlier this year, but could perhaps only happen when faced with a common enemy. And then take a personal example. Maybe you heard the story this week of 84-year-old former naturalist and explorer, Robin Hamlin Tennyson, who almost died of COVID. The turning point in his recovery was when his nurses wheeled him outside in his bed with all tubes still attached into the hospital's nature garden, where he awoke from an induced coma to see and hear the birds and plants around him. And that experience gave him the incentive to fight on and overcome the illness. And he's since climbed the highest mountain in Cornwall to raise funds for nature gardens in other hospitals. Robin describes himself as someone who having spent his life trying to save nature, ended up himself being saved by nature. what does Isaiah say about salvation? Of its 66 chapters, only the first 39 are thought to be, have been written by Isaiah, and in the distinctly unfavourable second half of the 8th century BCE, a time when the ten tribes of Israel were conquered and permanently dispersed. The next 15 chapters were written 200 years later, roughly, by his disciple, who's called Deutero Isaiah, and he also lived in troubled times, this time among the Judean exiles in Babylon. And the last, uh, sorry, the last 11 chapters, which are collectively called Trito Isaiah, were the work of several disciples of Jutero Isaiah. And those chapters were written in a more favorable period after Cyrus, king of Persia, conquered Babylon and repatriated the Jews. But although they were now free, the Jews faced the daunting task of having to rebuild their devastated capital city and homeland. Then, in the middle of that uphill struggle, came chapters 20, 60 to 62, which raised their sights to an even greater hope and task, that of restoring spiritual exiles to God's ways of righteousness and praise. That glorious promise would have to wait a long time for someone to fulfil it. For as we now know, that person was to be a baby boy born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth 500 years later. Jesus fulfilled Isaiah's promise by accepting God's power through John's baptism and then by resisting the temptation to misuse it for himself. He identified both with the vision and the responsibility of making that vision happen. So he returned to the synagogue in Nazareth on the Sabbath and stood to read the beginning of Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. But rather than finishing that verse with the day of vengeance of our God, Jesus finished by committing himself to be the good news. Sadly for them, his hearers only patronized and rejected him because Christ's mission was too wide to be confined to their demands. Faced with such an enormous task, what difference could one man make? Well, Jesus didn't try to achieve it all alone. He didn't spring his cousin John the Baptist from jail, let alone other prisoners. And he only helped a few of the blind folk of his time. And regarding oppression, though he challenged the religious authorities for burdening their subjects with taxation and legality, he submitted himself to their oppression. So how did Jesus proclaim the year of the Lord's favour? 
And the answer lies in the last verse of Isaiah 61. For as the soil makes the young plant come up, and the garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise bring up before all nations. I wonder if that verse inspired his parable of the sower, which we hear in Matthew 13, Mark 4 and Luke 8. After hearing him deliver that story to the public, Jesus' disciples asked him to explain it. And he described the sower as God, the seed as those who hear it, the birds as the devil, the rocky ground as poor soil, and thorns as worldly cares. He didn't actually say what makes good soil, which enables growth and fruitfulness. But if you think that plants, amongst other things, need light, water, food, and air, all of those things Jesus said, I am. So was 2020 the year of the Lord's favour? No. But I think it was a year of the Lord's favour. And so will 2021 be if we let God's righteousness and praise grow in us. And for that to happen, we need to ask Jesus Christ to inspire, guide and refresh us. Amen. And so we sing 169, Come, thou long expected Jesus. And so we now turn to two readings, uh, after which Mary Ann will bring us a reflection. And we're so grateful that she is part of um, part of our services and has been over these months. And so this first reading comes from um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. Rejoice always. Pray constantly and give thanks for everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't stifle the spirit, don't despise the prophetic gift, but test everything and accept only what is good. Avoid any semblance of evil. May the God of peace make you perfect in holiness. May you be preserved whole and complete, spirit and soul and body, irreproachable at the coming of our Saviour Jesus Christ. The one who calls us is trustworthy. God will make sure it comes to pass. And then from the Gospel of John in chapter 1, verses 6 to 8 and 19 to 28. Then came one named John, sent as an envoy from God, who came as a witness to testify about the light so that through his testimony everyone might believe. He himself wasn't the light. He came only to testify about the light, the true light that illumines all humankind. Now the temple authorities sent emissaries from Jerusalem, priests and Levites, to talk to John. Who are you? they asked. This is John's testimony. He didn't refuse to answer, but freely admitted, I am not the Messiah. Who are you then? they asked. Elijah? No, I am not, he answered. Are you the prophet? No, he replied. Finally, they said to him, Who are you? 
Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you have to say for yourself? John said, I am, as Isaiah prophesied, the voice of someone crying out in the wilderness, make straight our God's road. The emissaries were members of the Pharisee sect and they questioned him further. If you are not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, then why are you baptizing people? John said, I baptize with water because among you stands someone whom you don't recognize, the one who is to come after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy even to untie. This occurred in Bethany, across the Jordan River, where John was baptizing. May this word be open to us by God's spirit. Amen. And so we hand now to Mary Ann. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for asking me to be part of this service this morning. I do feel like I'm a part of your church, even though I've never met any of you, apart from my brother Dan, of course. Uh, and I've never been to Brighton or Hove, but I hope I'll be able to come down one day when all this nonsense is finished. Well, that, that's amazing wonders of technology, isn't it, that I can be part of your church from so far away. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, I live in Derbyshire with my husband, Andrew, and my daughter, Georgina, who you will have seen regularly. Um, Georgina and I are also part of Ambergate Methodist Church, and I'm a local preacher. Um, but since the beginning of lockdown, we've been worshipping with you, um, as you will have noticed. Um, our church has had one harvest service at the church and we've had one online Chris Dingle so far uh, so it's been great to be able to feel part of a church and see people. So just a few thoughts on the, the readings that we just heard this morning. The first is that Thessalonians reading. I love that Thessalonians reading. It starts rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. And I think it's a, a wonderful thought of living your life like that. And I'm in awe of people who just seem to be able to do that. People who are positive no matter what. People who always seem to be able to pray. People who don't moan about things but look on the positive side. And as much as I try, I have to admit that I really struggle to be that person. I seem to just keep going back to my default setting of moaning. Oh, life's just so difficult. But I keep remembering back to what Dan said a few weeks ago. Um, if you remember when he was talking about the sheep and the goats, and he said, we're all part sheep, we're all part goat, we need to get more sheepy. And so I, I, that's been really helpful to me to think about that and to think about how we can move towards being more like the people God made us to be. And then there's the reading from John, from John's Gospel that we heard. Now, we heard about a bit about John the Baptist last week from Jeff. And I have to say, I'd already written my message before I heard that um, service. And it is a similar message, really, this week. Maybe it's one that we need to keep hearing. And that reading shows a man who's got great news to share with people. I wonder if John was full of joy. I wonder if he was that kind of person. You know, when I imagined John, I've always imagined him to be a sort of dour sort of person. But when you think about it, he had such good news to share. Maybe he was a joyful person. His message was, look, look out, get ready. God's doing something amazing right here very soon. And he was a witness to the great thing that was happening. God in human form was coming among them. And that's the message of each and every Christmas, isn't it? Look out, God is here with us. Look what God's doing. Firstly, look at your own life. God is with us always. Even though at the moment we can't get to church buildings most of the time, we can't meet up with people. Um, but God is still with us just as much in our own homes. God loves us all. God accepts us no matter who we are. 
He will forgive us all of the times that we've messed up. All we have to do is be sorry and be willing to make a new start. God will put his Holy Spirit into each and every one of us. It's not just God with us at Christmas, it's God in us. What amazing news is that that God has got for us? And as I was preparing this, I've got to admit the word magical came to me. And I know it's not a word that we use in church and for very good reason. We don't want to get mixed up in magic, but it just seemed like the right word to me at that time. Maybe it's because I live in a unicorn obsessed bubble with a four year old. But that word magical, God loves us so much that he came to earth as a human baby. He spent time with people showing them what God's like. But he didn't allow all that fame to go to his head. He didn't go off the rails living a life of luxury. Instead, he kept on following God, his father, even though that meant going to a torturous death and a miraculous resurrection. And as I sat writing this message, and as I think about it now, it makes me rejoice. And I know that life isn't good for everyone, especially during this year of COVID. But no matter what, we do all have things to be thankful for, to rejoice about. And in our rejoicing, we can be witnesses to other people about the great news. Just as John was a witness to the great news all those years ago. And as I was preparing this, I read a few things. I wanted to share with you a few thoughts that I read, which really um, spoke to me. Even though John came prior to Christ as a witness, he is in many ways a model for all who follow. It says in Acts, you will be my witnesses. The church corporately is called to witness. During Advent, how full the church calendar is. It can be such a rich and rewarding experience. But over it all, over every song, cantata, party gift, service of worship, act of charity, Let the church first say, we are not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. The true light is in the world, but among the people, he is often the one they do not know. As I read that, I thought how different Advent is this year to that description of all the things that are going on. And as individuals and as a church, we've got a lot less contact with people. But following the instructions from Thessalonians, we should keep on rejoicing in the good news of God with us. We should keep on praying continually for the people that we can see, either literally or virtually, and the people that we can't see. And we should share our rejoicing with the people that we can. We're not saying, look at me, I've got it all sorted. None of us have. But we're saying, look at Jesus, he's God with us. Another thing I read was when we take God's goodness for granted, we tend to miss out on the joy and delight of celebration. And my husband and I recently celebrated 20 years since we got together as a couple. And obviously what we've been in lockdown and having a four year old daughter, we didn't get a chance to go out and celebrate. But I did spend that day appreciating what we've got together, celebrating with thankfulness all the blessings that we've received over those 20 years. And as I said earlier, it isn't the way that I continually live my life, but it felt really good to rejoice and be thankful. And that's what Advent and Christmas are about, taking time to realise what we have, to rejoice, to be thankful. And finally, something else that I read, and this was um, a comment about God's blessing to Elizabeth and Zechariah, with their son John and it said when the Lord fulfills his promises to me and answers my prayers it's really rarely just for me alone blessing also spills over to the lives of those around me and I know that God blessing me with Andrew and Georgina has been a blessing to so many other people as well and so too is our relationship with God a blessing to other people again not because we say look how good I am, but because we say, look how good God is. So like John, may we all be witnesses to the great news 
of God with us. I've chosen a song to follow this, um, I Am A City On A Hill. We had this at our um, online Chris Dingle service and it's been in my head ever since. I hope that you'll enjoy either watching or joining in with it. A real big thank you to Jonathan and to Mary Ann in sharing their thoughts and their reflections with us. Uh, if any of you have any comment or a question you'd like to ask, put a C or Q in the chat box and we can come to you. Um, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, Mary Ann, um, but a message from Marion and Bob Lennox, who used to live in Ambergate and were members of Ambergate Methodist Church. So, wow, I mean, that's just a, um, a small world that we live in, small world. I don't know if we've got anyone who wishes to make any comment or ask a question. Doesn't look so, so I think we'll turn to our prayers during this season of Advent. Uh, we pray for that spirit of Christ to come and to fill us that we might prepare ourselves for the message of the birth of the one who was the fullness of Christ and the fullness of God here on earth. And so our prayers are going to uh, be by the chat box. And so I do encourage you to write your messages, your prayers in there, which we will collect as usual and send around. But we're going to uh, have a piece of music while we're doing that. And it's O come, O come, Emmanuel. But it's a version by Enya, um, some of which is in English and some of which I think is in Latin. So um, a time for you to write your prayers and to make your prayers for God. And so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We turn then to our final hymn this morning. Uh, and I've tried to pick one kind of, uh, in a sense, thinking about the readings that we'd had and the messages that were, might have come through them. Uh, and it's uh, the hymn is called Send Down the Fire of Your Justice. It's number 413 in our uh, hymn book at the moment. It tries to link together, for, well, for me, it links together this fact of the spirit of the Lord is upon us, um, that we are filled with the spirit, the spirit that Christ uh, brought and uh, that was filled, or that Jesus was filled with. It kind of, for me, talks about us needing to become more sheepy. Uh, so thank you for reminding us about that, mary -Ann. It's a model for us to follow, that model that Jesus lives, reaching out, fighting for justice, care for all. It's send down the fire of your justice. So may we be filled with God's spirit, that we may become each day more sheepy. And as we are blessed, may we be a blessing to each other, to all who we meet, to all people throughout the world. In the name of Christ. Amen.